Okay, now I would like to explain to you why the matrix that we've been using that consists of columns that represents each of the basis vectors under the transformation, why it works, why it needs to be that matrix and no other. So we're talking about some linear transformation and from the previous two examples you've, you've gathered that when we say linear transformation the space of vectors could be just about whatever you want, it could be geometric vectors, it could be functions, it could be polynomials, it can be strains and stresses, it can be matrices themselves, uh, maybe not a very useful example, but it could be the sky is the limit of what it could be. And there's a linear transformation T. You saw a couple of examples of linear transformations. And you saw in each case that the linear transformation can be applied directly. You don't even need to refer to a basis or mention a basis. Here is a vector, here is its image under the transformation. Here is another vector, here is an image under the transformation. Here is a geometric vector, here is its image under reflection. Here is a polynomial, here is its image under dilation. No need for bases at all. But suppose you now want the algebraic perspective, the algebraic methods, so you introduce a basis. Now what do you want to do? Now you want the mechanism for going not from a vector to its image, but going from the components of the vector to the components of the image. So you want to do the exact same thing but in component space. It's a wonderful expression component space. It's the space where everything is represented by components, whether it's geometric vectors that you started out with, or polynomials, or functions, or strains, or stresses, or flows, or velocity fields, and so forth. By the time you convert it into component space, they always look the same. They're just sets of n numbers, if the space is n-dimensional. And in that component space, we want to rule for going from the components of the vector to the components of its image under the linear transformation. And that rule, remarkably, is always simply multiplication by a matrix. It's amazing, it's amazing how many concepts can be captured by multiplication by a matrix. Linear transformations is just one of them. Gaussian elimination can be captured by matrices. Uh, Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, not a matrix procedure to begin with, but is represented by matrix products. Inner products represented by matrix products. That's what makes matrix algebra such a powerful tool, because so many different concepts find representation in the world with just one operation, matrix multiplication. It's a very powerful and effective idea that matrix multiplication with proper wrapping can be made to represent so many different things. Anything that's linear or bilinear, anything that's linear can be represented by matrix multiplication. That's what, when, when we say that something's represented by matrix, we're really implying matrices will be multiplying. It's no use to put things into a big table if you're not able to use that remarkable matrix multiplication operation. So what matrix is it? What matrix is it? Multiplication by which, sorry for an awkward sentence, will affect the translation from the components of the vector to the components of the image. That's very easy to see. So I will actually do uh, a little bit of crafty notation. I'll mix together uh, numbers and vectors and put them and organize them in matrices. But you'll see it'll be uh, I think quite insightful and simple enough. So our goal is to go from the components of U to the components of V. From the components of U to the components of V. Well, here's how you would proceed. I don't know, I'll just keep rolling with this identity and we'll just see where we need to stop. So, when you start with the vector U and you want to see its components. You see, I hesitate to put an arrow over it because I usually reserve arrows for vectors that are geometric vectors. Arrow, draw, uh, directed segments. Arrows drawn on a blackboard. You know, so here actually, this is hard, harder work, but I'll just make it bold. You know what? I'll use yellow chalk for... So I'm holding two chalks. All the vector quantities are yellow. All the scalar quantities are white. So u equals, so we'll just, let's stick to three dimensions, but of course this generalizes to n dimensions, but more importantly you will notice 
that I chose a basis. I didn't write it down. E1, E2, E3. My basis is E1, E2, E3. Let's call this the basis B. And I'm not specifying anything about this basis. It's an arbitrary basis. So, the vector U can be represented as U1, E1, plus U2, E2, plus U3, E3. <laughs> U1, E1, plus U2, E2, plus U3, E3. Now, let's apply the linear transformation T to both sides. On the left, we'll have TU. On the right-hand side, and now we're really taking advantage of the fact that the transformation is linear. It means it will split on these plus signs, and it means that it will bypass the constant and apply to the vector. T of u equals u1 t of e1. <laughs> Should have practiced. u1 t of e1 plus u2 t of e2. plus u3 t over u3. So we've just taken advantage of the fact that the linear transformation is indeed linear. This is the linearity of the transformation. Now let's start pushing this towards matrix form. Please realize that we can write this like this. This is a 3 by 1 vector, quote unquote, excuse me, 1 by 3 matrix that consists of T of E1, T, T of E1, T of E2, T of E3. Multiplying the 3 by 1 matrix, multiplying the 3 by 1 matrix of U1, U2, U3. Can you see that? If I were to multiply, you know, this as according to the matrix formalism, it would be U1 T of E1 plus U2 T of E2 plus U3 T of E3. Okay. Now, now this is where this comes from. Suppose that this, this now needs to be this vector. Suppose this vector is re-expressed and the original basis by the numbers T1, 1, T2, 1, and T3, 1. So in other words, suppose that T of E1 is T1, 1, E1, plus T2, 1, E2, plus T3, 1, E3. And that this matrix, that this vector right here, is represented by T1, 2, T2, 2, and T3, 2. So I will put plus signs here. So in other words, T of E1 equals this coefficient times E1, plus this coefficient times E2, plus this coefficient times E3. And this T of E2 equals this coefficient times E1, plus this coefficient times E2, plus this coefficient times E3. And likewise for this final one. T1, 3, T2, 3, T3, 3. With plus signs, E1, E2, E3. All right. All of this, by the way, is V, because V equals T of U. Okay, so now that we realize that what these, how these vectors are represented with respect to the basis itself as these three linear combinations, let's put it all, let's push this towards matrix notation. And the way to do it is this, is to put 
E1, E2, E3 into a row matrix. And organize those numbers into a matrix that you can almost see right there. T11, T12, T13, T21, T22, T23, and finally T31, T32, and T33. Okay, just realize that what you see here can actually be written now this way, because if you now use the formalism of matrix multiplication, the first column of the answer would be T11E1 plus T21E2 plus T31E3, with exactly what you see here. So in the according to the matrix formalism, this matrix of vectors, you see I, I stuck in vector entries. It's not what you're used to seeing, but it's just a nice way to use matrices to organize the calculation, to just write this sum. It's just a trick. It sort of triggers matrix multiplication formalism to express what I want in a nice way. And then of course here is U1, U2, U3 for the right. U1, U2, U3 for the right. And don't forget that all of this equals V. So let me erase this part and write what V equals in the same form. Uh, let's see, where is my eraser? <laughs> this is a bizarre disappearance. Okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, let me see. Maybe I don't even need to erase. Yeah, I will. This is where I want. I won't. I want it all on the board. So, let's not forget that all of this, all of this equals V. Where V can be written as, well, V, of course, is V1 E1 plus V2 E2 plus V3 E3, which can be re rewritten in the following way, using the same trick. E1, E2, E3, E1, E2, E3, times V1, V2, V3. There you go. And now, of course, matching this with this, we realize that at the 3 by 1 vector that we're looking at right here, this one right here, has got to be V1, V2, V3. Now I'm almost feeling like I've made it more complicated than it needs to be. Maybe it's even easier to see than this. I will give you one brief note that will show you that maybe it's even easier to see than this. But you see that, so now we have a mechanism for going from the components of the input to the components of the output. From the components of the input to the components of the output. And that rule is simply matrix multiplication. So it's that truth that we'll see over and over again, just about anything. Anything that's linear can be expressed not just by tables and a number, not, by, not just by numbers and a table, but by matrix multiplication that comes with those tables. And that the vector of the components of the output equals this precise matrix, this matrix that, rep that is the representation of T of E1 with respect to the same basis. That's how, that's why those matrices are formed that way. 
Okay? So I really don't have anything else to say in this line of reasoning. Right? It's, we see that it's this matrix that, that is the representation of the image of each of the basis vectors under the transformation, and it's their representation with respect to the same basis. That's why it's those matrices that I was writing on the board, and that's why that's the matrix that represents the linear transformation. So, this is actually quite not so complicated and maybe good to see, but here's a less complete, but maybe a simpler example, and in some ways more convincing. A simpler argument, and in some ways more convincing argument. And it'll go like this. So let me just erase everything but the matrix. And let's, so what do we want from this matrix? We want this matrix to go from the components of the input to the components of the output. That's all we require of this matrix. That it goes, that it takes us from the components of the input to the components of the output. And to make sure that it holds, let's just make sure of one thing. That for the basis vectors, it does what we want it to do. Going from the components of the input to the components of the output. And if something, and if we live in a linear world, and something holds for all of the basis vectors, then it surely holds for all the vectors in this case. So let's just make sure that by the very construction, you will see that's how that's why it'll work, by the very construction, this matrix will take us from the components of the input for the components of that, but is that at, at the very least it holds for the basis vectors. And here's how it works. Well, let's apply it to E1. What are the components of E1? Well, of course, the components of E1 are 1, 0, 0. That's what the components of basis vectors always look like with respect to the same basis. And what's this product? This product is, of course, what is this product? 1 times the first column plus 0 times the second column plus 0 times the third. So it's just the first column. Okay. And are these the components of the output? Yes, by the very construction. What did we put in this column? We put in the components of T of E1. That's how we construct these matrices. We say, take E1, apply the linear transformation to it. You saw two examples of it. And then take the result and re-express it in the same basis. So these are the components of the output. So for the first basis vector, this matrix does exactly what the doctor ordered. It, go, it takes us from the components of the input to the components of the output, but the very construction. And of course, the same would be true for the second basis element. It would produce this column. Works once again. For the right out input, it gives the right output. Similarly, for the third, for the third vector in the basis, it'll do the right thing. From the components of the input, it'll produce the components of the output. Why? By the very construction. That's what we put in these columns. We put in these columns the very numbers that are the components of the output for the basis vectors. And we can see that by, mul by matrix multiplication with these kinds of vectors, it holds. So that's why that's the matrix that represents the linear transformation with respect to the particular basis. Okay, I hope you enjoyed these three short videos. <laughs> I certainly did. Thank you very much. See you soon.